In the previous video, we learned about Python's coroutines and some of how a cooperative coroutine scheduler works. In this video, we'll try our hand at writing some asynchronous code using Python coroutines and asyncio. It's easy to create a coroutine. All we have to do is use the async keyword on a function and use a wait anytime we want to call other coroutines. Once we have a coroutine, though, we can't just call it. To start the ball rolling, if we try to call it, it just immediately returns a coroutine object. That's not much use. Instead, we need to add the coroutine to asyncio's scheduler as a new task, and then we need the scheduler to run. Arranging for coroutines to execute and handling input and output events. The asyncio package automatically creates a default scheduler, also called an event loop. While it's possible to create new event loop objects or to replace the default one, for our purposes, the default event loop will work just fine. We could get a reference to it by calling asyncio's get event loop function. To tell the scheduler that we want it to start a new task, running the given coroutine, we call asyncio's ensure future function. By default, this will create the task in the default scheduler, but we can also override that by passing an explicit event loop to the loop keyword only parameter of the ensure future function. Notice that we didn't just pass the coroutine function to ensure future. We actually invoked it right there inside ensure future's arguments. Just because the ensure future function doesn't actually want a reference to the coroutine function. Ensure future wants the coroutine object that we saw the coroutine function return earlier. The name ensure future might seem somewhat odd. If it's used for launching tasks, why is it called that? The fact of the matter is that launching tasks is basically just a side effect of what the function conceptually does, which is wrap. Wrap its parameter in a future object if necessary. It just so happens that a future for the return value of a coroutine would be useless if the coroutine was never scheduled to run. So, ensure future, make sure that it does. The ensure future function adds a new task to the scheduler whether it's called from normal code or within a coroutine, which means that any time we want code to run in its own stream of execution, we can use ensure future to get it going. Even now that we've added the coroutine to the scheduler, as a new task, nothing happens. That's because the scheduler itself is still not running. That's a problem easily solved. We just need to call either the run forever or run until complete method of the loop. Finally, our coroutine actually executes. As the names imply, run forever causes the event loop to run forever or at least until it's explicitly stopped by calling its stop method. While the run until complete method causes the loop to keep going until a particular future object is ready to provide a value. The return value from ensure future is a future object, so it's easy to have the scheduler run until a particular task is done. This example runs two coroutines simultaneously as two separate tasks in the same scheduler. The coro1 coroutine contains an infinite loop, so it will never finish. But the coro2 coroutine not only finishes, it eventually calls the event loop stop method to force run forever to terminate. This example behaves exactly the same way, except it uses run until complete to automatically stop the scheduler once coro2 is finished, instead of explicitly calling stop. The code looks a little cleaner this way, so as a rule of thumb, it's probably better to only use stop when some sort of error makes it necessary to dump out of the event loop. In both of the examples we've just seen, there's a line of code to set the logging level to critical. 
That's because the event loop issues an error message if it is stopped while there are tasks, such as the Cora 1 task, still running. In this case, we know it's still running and don't care, so we suppress the message. It's usually better to arrange for all of our running tasks to exit cleanly instead of just killing them like this, which is why the error message is printed. But in this case, there's no problem. So, we just keep the message from printing. Regardless of how we choose to run and stop an event loop, once we're completely finished with it, we should call its close method. That closes any open files, network sockets, and other I.O. channels that the event loop is managing, and generally cleans up after it. A good way to handle that is to use the context lib.closingContext manager which guarantees that the close method will be called once the with block ends, even in error situations. The close method should be called when we're completely done with an event loop, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it should be called right after the run forever or run until complete call finishes. The event loop is still in a valid state at that point, and it's perfectly okay to, for example, add some new tasks, start the loop running again, as you've probably noticed, an async IO event loop object fulfills basically the same role as a concurrent.futures executor object from a programming interface point of view. That's not the only similarity. In the next video, we're going to look at async IO's future class and how it's used.